Welcome to the Light Reading Podcast, the sponsored edition. This is Phil Harvey. I'm an editor here at Light Reading, and I'm joined on the podcast today by uh, the CEO of Packet Fabric, Dave Ward, a uh, former Cisco vet. And uh, we talk about, uh, first of all, who Packet Fabric is, why he decided to join as CEO. He was just brought on uh, back in April, so he hasn't been at the helm long, but he seems really excited about uh, the opportunity that's ahead of him. Uh, we talk about how Packet Fabric differentiates itself in the industry, um, how it delivers on the networking as a service opportunity, uh, how you would kind of compare the company to SD WAN and uh, you know other types of technologies that are less connection oriented and seem to be more like in the uh, you know pointed toward the future of networking. And uh, we also talk a little bit about Dave's uh, conservation work. Uh, there's some interesting stuff he's doing where he's applying uh, uh, what he knows about technology uh, and and uh, high tech and IoT to uh, helping endangered species. So you definitely want to uh, stick around for that at the back end of the podcast. And uh, we will get right to it right after this break. This light reading podcast is sponsored by Packet Fabric. Packet Fabric's network as a service platform weaves together the perfect solution for your network. Get private access to the cloud. Get secure connectivity between your data centers. Get an on-ramp to the secure internet. Get to market faster with network automation. Build a network for today's enterprise. To get started, go to packetfabric.com. Welcome to the Light Reading Podcast. This is Phil Harvey. I'm an editor here at Light Reading, and I'm joined on the podcast today by Dave Ward, the CEO of Packet Fabric. Hi, Dave. Hey, Phil. Hey, everybody. Glad to be here. Thanks for being on the podcast. I am curious about uh, you. I'm curious about Packet Fabric, and uh, and I'll I'll start the other way around. Let's start with talking about the company. Um, first of all, for our uh, audience, Packet Fabric sounds like a familiar enough name, but I bet you most people don't know exactly what you guys do. So tell me a little bit about the company and and what it is Packet Fabric does. Yeah, well, I hope folks know about Packet Fabric, but you know, I'll, I'll give a quick drive by. We are a network as a service company, a secure private internet. And we're trying to do for network as a service, what cloud did for compute and storage as a service, make it in, make secure private internet and interconnection um, in interconnection to private cloud, public clouds, enterprise application clouds, collaboration clouds, point and click easy. And Really, we manage and operate this secure private fabric um, on, you know, such that enterprises don't need to take that on themselves if they don't want to. And by doing that, um, we provide, uh, you know, not only North America, but also have a, a global footprint as well and provide that connectivity for both cloud on ramp, secure private Internet and really that, that full connectivity to, between uh, enterprise locations and the full distributed uh, enterprise employee base. So an enterprise would connect to your secure private fabric and that would facilitate connection to all these other points that they would be going as a business. That would be all the cloud providers, um, offsite storage, branch offices, all of that stuff. Correct, and, and also to the collaboration clouds and enterprise application clouds as well. And so, right, right. What's interesting, the you know the one of the problems we're trying to solve is not only just network as a service and really facilitate real time oper operationalization of networking, but actually remain calm when I say this, but actually really try and change the internet architecture as and what I mean by that, and changing the internet architecture for for enterprises is that there's a couple of choices available today. There's traditional let's say MPLS VPNs to provide that virtual private networking between all the branches, et cetera. And then there's the public internet. And we're right now at that transitional history where enterprises need full internet connectivity, but they need it to be secure and private and traffic engineered for bandwidth and latency guarantees and bounded jitter. And they also need it telco redundant. And this really becomes Packet Fabric's niche, providing those services but making it real-time instant provisioning uh, and API driven. It's kind of a cross between you know the 
I guess the, the freedom of the wide open internet and, you know, and, and, uh, the consumer internet and the managed service of, uh, MPLS VPNs, which everybody would be used to, I guess, on the enterprise side. It is. And it's really that modern approach. And so mm-hmm. what, uh, what packet fabrics done different is it is, we are managing and operating, uh, an independent network that is carrier neutral. It's managed from the cloud with the most modern concepts of software design patterns and construction. It's got SDN to the devices, layer one through three, uh, meaning optical through ethernet, say through through layer three. It's API driven, so that way, um, you know, people can integrate with us just by coding to those APIs. And we have this flexible consumption model, uh, which not only is month to month, but also is pay for what you use. So it's really, really similar to that model you get for compute and storage um, on demand out of the cloud, but now you can get it out of the network. And so um, what's fascinating is it's really a new market category for, for delivering network, which kind of makes it a little bit interesting to try and describe, but at the same time, it's really pulling together the concepts that that Phil, we've talked about as an industry now for 10 to 12 years of, of bringing together SDN and orchestration and cloud-based management, but also taking a step forward beyond just a next-gen OSS to a next-gen BSS, a next-gen billing system is what I'm referring to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that makes it, it, it sort of turns this idea of a connection-oriented service into um, something that, that you know, should be billed as it's consumed, right? As, a, as opposed to just paying, you know, you're kind of paying rent on the connection itself. Now you're actually, you feel like you're, um, you're, you're being billed for e- each instance of use, which is a lot more, um, I would guess, a lot more attractive to, uh, uh, you know, versus the old kind of uh, uh, MPLS based model. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I'll, I'll give, just give a couple of, of, you know, easy to understand examples. If you're doing archive work, the movement of your, your, you know, of your data as you're doing that archive, let's say it takes a day to move, you know, some amount, some amount of, of files that you want to move. You're not right. using the network for the other days of the month. Same thing for disaster recovery. Same thing for sports, media and entertainment, moving genomics files if you're in healthcare. You know, if you, if you have... Uh, the ability to understand your traffic patterns as an enterprise, you have the ability to really take advantage of this cloud consumption model for network as a service. Now, we also, of course, offer nailed up fabric connections and interconnections um, across our fabric in a more traditional sense. Um, for those who are like, hey, look, I, I, my patterns are, are you know really kind of all over the place. They might not have diurnal patterns to them or, or otherwise. And so let me just get a traditional... 100 gig link, you know, or 100 gig, 100 gig multi-site, you know, connections across your fabric and away we go. And I'm good with that. And we're fine. Uh, we're fine with both models and allow our customers to use the APIs to switch between models. The other thing, just, just one more on that, with that pay for what you use, because of the real-time nature of our orchestration system, you can increase and decrease the amount of bandwidth, you know, that you're, that you're using from us in real time on demand. And so that in conjunction with a flexible consumption model, frankly, is at, you know, is at the bleeding edge of the way to interact with a network. If you are really in tune as an enterprise or in tune as you know, a content producer, et cetera, on, on the type of traffic patterns you have. And that definitely sounds more like what, we're, what enterprises are becoming used to with the, the cloud services that they consume. Um, yeah, I think so as well. Um, also, what's interesting is that in our points of presence, um, you know, we're we're beginning to add compute platforms for that distributed edge, and you know, we realize that, let's say, you know, talking about the pandemic that we're in now, you know, SD WAN has been a, a long-standing conversation in the industry, and you've had many conversations with with uh, vendors, producers, leaders, and enterprises on that topic. One of the interesting thing about the internet architecture that we're really trying to change is this notion of centralized service clouds, where let's say you're backhauling your SDN tunnel to an SDN concentrator that's in a public cloud, or there's a public, sorry, a cloud-based security service that again is in a centralized cloud. And it may be multiple centralized clouds. I don't mean centralized just to mean one, but I mean, you know, in the geographic region, 
we're thinking about this differently, and it's been discussed in the industry quite a bit, where can we create a distributed edge and actually have the networking or VPN concentrators or secure internet gateways and security services really pushed out uh, to the distributed edge as close to the enterprise employee or user as possible, and then get on this engineered, uh, highly engineered fabric that we have, which is highly, highly redundant. It's really, it's really telco grade. Now, the point of this, Phil, is really, can you get the cost advantages of SD-WAN access, but then the engineered and user experience benefits of having you know, an, an engineered secure private fabric underneath it when trying to reach all of the enterprise application clouds, collaboration, et cetera. That, uh, that new market and that new technology, as I said, is, is not fitting into, into common categories, but that's really what we're going after. Okay. And, um, you know, you were hired uh, or you took over as CEO in, uh, or you were and it was announced in April, so not, not that long ago. Um, prior to that, uh, in 2019, the company had raised a pretty significant funding round. I think it was around $75 million. Um, what, what prompted you to, uh, to join the company and, uh, and, and where is the company in terms of its, uh, its, its own life cycle in terms of its, uh, you know, how, how big the, uh, the organization is. So I'm going to go backwards into that piece. So the, the company is about a hundred employees now, uh, the series B that was raised, um, you know, is what you're, what you're discussing, uh, last year, which brought in digital alpha as the primary investor along with networks. And the, the history of the company is one that, um, you know, it originated um, in NAT several years ago, but then focused a couple of years ago on this network as a service piece. And that's when DA stepped in. Patrick Soon Shong, uh, you know, was the one who catalyzed the creation of the company. Uh, he's the owner of the LA Times. He uh, is a biomedical pioneer down in LA. Uh, and he realized that, and he does genetics work uh, to cure cancer, and he realized that he needed to be able to move very large files between his companies and his research facilities, for example. Hmm. And there wasn't a telco service that could do that. So he's like, why don't I just build it? I mean, he's a visionary on multiple on multiple fronts, and he was a visionary on this on this case, not even having rode the SDN wave like many of us in the, in the rest of the industry, but just saw that it was necessary and built it. And then, and then with a Series B bringing digital alpha, um, it really has honed into this network as a service platform. Now, what brought me to the company after you know 20 years at Cisco and, and a stint as a Juniper Fellow as well, was that I had been talking and working towards building uh, software-defined networking APIs into the operating systems at Juniper and Cisco and across Cisco's portfolio, working on the tools um, necessary to enable cloud-managed orchestration and controller-managed orchestration. And I really wanted to turn my career from not just producing um, kit and, and products and routers and switches, et cetera, but actually creating outcomes and solutions. And I had to take a step outside vendor land into, into actually running and operating um, a network as a service company to get to the outcomes and solutions I wanted to create. And Packet Fabric, from a technology point of view, um, really the brainchild of one of our founders, Anna Claiborne, who's our head of products, engineering and ops, um, really has put together just a fantastic engineering team coming out of operations coming out of that net dev heritage where most of the senior folks or all of the senior folk development folks on the team have actually built several uh, network orchestration automation systems for other network providers came together and said okay let's let's go build this from scratch again and that became the origin of packet fabric to really hit this secure private internet fabric model the other founder that's with us Jezebel Gilmore she, um, she is a long-standing member of um, an operators groups around the world and just an incredible energizer bunny, um, meaning that she is <laughs> you know, really just all over the internet and understand how it works from data centers to WAN to enterprises, et cetera. Just a fantastic, fantastic couple of women to work with. And it's really quite inspiring. Jezebel is our head of commercial. And what also brought me to Packet Fabric, not only was the technology, really was the opportunity. 
Packet Fabric has a great product, massive scale, massive performance, really, really simple to use and needed help to get to the next level. And so with my technical background and also seeing the opportunities through my experience of IT as a service, infrastructure as a service and network as a service, as a change in the consumption and business model of enterprises that I've experienced, I wanted to go to a company that was doing that. And that's why um, my packet fabric was so exciting and, and why I'm really, really happy to be here with the team. Like I said, it's about a hundred people now. We're focusing mm-hmm. on on not only um, continuing to expand and grow our foot global footprint, but also um, the portfolio. As I mentioned, there's multiple pillars of that, you know, of the cloud management provisioning system, the billing system, the data coming out of it as it's telco grade. But I saw the opportunity to uh, go after channels and resellers and have that powered by packet fabric under solutions that are created by some of the biggest solution partners um, in the industry to connect together all these pieces. And I know I'm getting a little long-winded here, Phil, but the, the point on these solutions that I'm going after is really to be able to connect the disparate public clouds, hybrid, hybrid, hybrid private colos, as well as those enterprise application clouds together. That tie, easy tie together of all those services, which defines the modern enterprise and defines the tools that modern enterprise employees use, I want to deliver that solution. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, really quickly, what's what would be is was it um, sort of that there was a recent ex- um, announcement with NTT uh, data centers? Was that more of a uh, kind of in the channel distribution type category, or was that just them being a consumer of of packet fabric service, or both? Yeah, actually, a combination of both. Almost all of our channel resellers that we have now are a combination of both. Um, mm-hmm. And, and there are a lot of data center operators, and that was with uh, entities, that announcement was, was with NTT data centers. And now we can build off of that and continue to build off of that um, towards the bigger solutions. And, and of course, NTT and NTT Global as, as a, just a, a massive and important company on the internet has that ability to, to use this as infrastructure, use this as cloud on-ramp, and then you know, through NTT Global to build solutions with us as well. And so um, I'm really excited about those partnerships and then the, the path forward as well. And towards that end, um, we uh, were working to bring in um, continued new leaders uh, into the company. And uh, Chris Dedicote has agreed to join us as chairman of the board. And he was uh, head of all sales at Cisco and just one of those individuals that's really going to be able to help me and the company get to the next level. Excellent. And th- th- this this just popped into my head as I was as I was thinking through how I would describe pa- packet fabric to somebody. Would packet fabric be something that would replace SD WAN, or or would an enterprise use it in addition to SD WAN? Like what? Because SD WAN, I think it has a has a broader kind of familiarity now than it maybe did eighteen months ago. Um, people are starting to get used to it, and it's also kind of expanded its own definition in that it's uh, you know. It, it means basically just enterprise networking <laughs> almost, um, you, but done in a slightly new way. So how, how does Packet Fabric sort of see itself in relation to what's going on with SD-WAN? We see ourselves and I see Packet Fabric as an augmentation of SD-WAN and the architecture that SD-WAN brings. SD-WAN is still a hub and spoke model. There's, there's mm-hmm. many many endpoints that are the, the spokes, and in general, there's uh, an SD-WAN concentrator that's the hub that could be on-prem at the enterprise or in a public cloud. And if you just think about the traffic pattern coming from that, your, your traffic is going to go across your tunnel, up to that concentrator, and then back around again to where it needs to go on the internet. We have a fundamentally different architecture of being that distributed fabric. And that's why we can, I believe we can really augment SD-WAN by getting the SD-WAN concentrators into our distributed POPs as close to the end user as possible. And then the end, then the employee or end user rides on this really highly tuned, highly redundant fabric to get to the applications that they used to do their job. And so that SD-WAN premium um, is a fundamental shift of the SD-WAN architecture, again, from a hub and spoke long tunnel based to a spoke to dramatically distributed hubs in very short tunnel and then riding on again that highly engineered network hopefully that answered that part 
Yeah, you did actually. I think that's an important distinction too, because I think that's what people will, you know, they'll, they'll sort of imagine when it's like, uh, you know, moving, moving away from like an MPLS model or a connectivity oriented model. Um, because that's, that's, that's one of the points about SD WAN as well. So I think, I think the, the description, uh, uh, gives, gives people a kind of a point of comparison and, uh, and that will definitely help. You're involved in some conservation work. Um, you want to give us a bit of background about what what it is you're involved in, what you're passionate about, and then maybe talk about um, if there's any particular projects or uh, things that you're you're working on specifically. Yeah, I'm I've become a very passionate techno conservationist, and I know I'm now coining a new term, but um, you know, being a geek and a longstanding you know, community networking guy, as well as, as building a lot of, a lot of, uh, technology in my past and not being an applied scientist. I wanted, I believe that we're at the point in time where technology can be used for, for conservation and protecting endangered species. And so many years ago, um, and the way these things go at large companies, when I was at Cisco, um, there, you know, there's a huge rhino poaching problem in South Africa. And the founder of Dimension Data, Doc Watson, went to John Chambers and said, can you help uh, solve this problem? And the way things work in big companies and, and with my good friend John is John makes a commitment and then it trickles down and lands in somebody's lap who can get shit done. And it landed right in my lap. And so I, you know, I was building routers at the time and operating systems. And I'm like, but I'll give it a shot. <clears throat> and we put together an, an anti-poaching solution using IoT technology and video analytics and, and data science. Um, around the, you know, in an area near the Kruger National Park in South Africa. And then we, um, over time, it became quite effective and uh, a doc Nat Geo documentary was made and that's called Save This Rhino. And Kevin Peterson is a star and he's an international cricket star and I played the geek and, and put the solution together. But that moved forward as we then deployed, you know, many, many um, solutions that we put in South Africa into Tanzania and Kenya and Mozambique and 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 other other countries in, in Africa, that some marine folks came to me and said, "Hey, um, can technology be used to uh, protect sharks? And can we learn more yeah. from the marine ecosystem?" And again, playing the geek, not being the applied scientist, I'm like, "I think we can do better than the smart buoys that are out there, and I bet we can do something with." communication technology and, and, and what's available. And so we started working on sharks in Florida, Bahamas, and Australia uh, with, and made a Nat Geo documentary about it um, with a championship surfer named Nick Fanning. And that that documentary, Save the Shark, is coming out uh, Tuesday, September 15th. Now, what's interesting and what I learned from this and, and what I think the audience might find interesting, Phil, is that in addition to being able to tag sharks and track that and get the data back in real time and even put cameras on sharks and 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 have all that back in real time in the labs, we learned that um, tiger sharks, which are exotherms, meaning they, they are the temperature of the water, they stay within a mm -hmm. very, very small band of temperature of the Gulf Stream on the East Coast. And when you put a tag on the shark that tells us where the shark is, it also can measure the temperature of the water. Okay, so as mm -hmm. tiger sharks move are seen further inland and further north, we're working with the shark scientists and with climatologists to understand the impact of human activity on ocean currents and thus, you know, on, on overall climate change. And by saving the shark, we're actually then able to understand and potentially, you know, work to change human activity as we're potentially changing the, the earth due to, uh, due to that activity. And so it became a very interesting outcome. You never know going into technology problems and these techno conservation problems, what you're going to learn and come out the other side. But um, it's really become a fascinating, uh, fascinating intellectual exercise, plus a passion of mine. And from there, we've gone on and done some rhino conservation work in Assam, India, one of the last places that um, you can see rhinos in India. And they were recently, Assam is in the news recently because it's monsoon season. And we were trying uh -huh. to solve not only poaching problems, but also animal conservation problems and what we can do about the impact of floods. And of course, in particular, in all of these cases, I'm describing a human wildlife conflict. And needless to say, many people describe the current pandemic as a human wildlife conflict as we've encroached uh, into new ecosystems as well as interacted with animals like we haven't before as humans mm -hmm. and thus 
you know, COVID, COVID came out of that. And so it's, it's very yeah. much a passion of mine and how I can apply technology and my experience towards these conservation efforts. Well, that's really cool. What is the, uh, uh, the documentary that's coming up on, uh, save the shark? When, when is that, uh, when, when should we look for that? And, and do you know where we can find it? Yeah, you bet. Uh, save the shark.com and you can see the trailer coming out. Um, and it's, but it, the film itself is coming out Tuesday, September 15th on the Nat Geo channel. Perfect. All right, Dave Ward, CEO of Packet Fabric. Thanks so much for being on the podcast. It was great, Phil. Thanks a ton. That is it. That's our show. Thanks so much to Dave Ward, CEO of Packet Fabric, for his time and insights. Thanks to Packet Fabric, the company, for being our podcast sponsor for this month. We do appreciate it. Thanks to our producer, Tian Fu, for making us sound good even when we don't. And thank you, dear listener, because if you weren't paying attention, we wouldn't be able to get away with doing all of this at work. Please do tell a friend to subscribe. You can hit the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts, on Google Play, on Spotify, and on SoundCloud, and probably hundreds of other podcast apps. Uh, We really do appreciate you listening to this very special sponsored edition of the Light Reading Podcast. This Light Reading Podcast is sponsored by Packet Fabric. Packet Fabric's network as a service platform weaves together the perfect solution for your network. Get private access to the cloud. Get secure connectivity between your data centers. Get an on-ramp to the secure internet. Get to market faster with network automation. Build a network for today's enterprise. To get started, go to packetfabric.com.